Australians. Order it being 2 p.m. The time for debate has expired. Thank you, Senator Stirl. The committee reports progress. We'll go straight to questions. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The Prime Minister has claimed his only involvement in the Community Sports Infrastructure Program was passing along information. Why then, on the day before he called the election, did the Prime Minister obtain a colour-coded spreadsheet from Senator Mackenzie with projects she intended to approve listed by party and electorate? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. The first point uh, I would uh, make uh, is that, as Sports Australia advised to the Senate uh, committee uh, earlier today, the brief uh, with the decisions uh, was signed on the 4th of April, that is a week before uh, the election uh, was called. Obviously, subsequent to that, obviously subsequent to that, uh, in the context of uh, usual announcement arrangements, you would expect there to be uh, some communications in order to make the necessary arrangements. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister confirm that the final community sports infrastructure program spe spreadsheet rejected 73 per cent of the projects recommended by Sports Australia? And can the minister also confirm the Prime Minister obtained it the day before he called the election? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, the first point I could make, I can confirm, as we have confirmed uh, consistently for a very long time, that the final decisions in relation to uh, successful projects uh, were made uh, by Senator McKenzie as the uh, Minister for Sport. Uh, and, 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 indeed, and indeed, Senator McKenzie uh, ensured that there was a fairer uh, distribution of the available funds to uh, projects around Australia, including by making sure that a, a larger Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. This goes to a very important question of the proportion of projects rejected and also an important question as to timing. The Prime Minister obtaining the brief the day prior to calling the federal election. I'd ask the Minister to be directly relevant to those questions. You reminded the Minister of the question. I'm listening very carefully to his answer. He has 34 seconds remaining. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, well, I am being directly relevant because I'm confirming the fact that the decision maker was uh, Minister McKenzie, and the decision was made a week before, a week before the election was called. But of course, subsequently, uh, as you would expect, there were communications uh, to uh, ensure that uh, announcement arrangements were put in place as appropriate. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. To be clear, is the Prime Minister aware that Senator Mackenzie provided a signed and backdated brief to Sports Australia approving the final round of projects on the day he called the election? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, all I can do in relation to that question is refer you back to the evidence by Sports Australia to the Senate Committee, where they made clear that the brief was signed Order. on the 4th Senate of April. Okay. Sorry. He, the minister has concluded his answer. Order. Before I come to the next question, I would like to draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber and the gallery of a parliamentary delegation from the European Union. On behalf of all the sen all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, in particular, this afternoon to the Senate. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister advise the Senate of the Morrison government's plan to prepare for the global challenge of the coronavirus in the aged care sector? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator McDonald, uh, McLaughlin, for his question. Uh, Mr President, while we may be faced with responding to a worldwide uh, pandemic, Australia is leading the way in preparedness, including in planning for aged care. The Department of Health's website carries a number of fact sheets on the novel coronavirus named COVID-19 that I would like to table in the chamber today. Mr. President, I'd also like to table a copy of a letter that's been sent to providers by the Chief Medical Officer. Mr. Mr. President, uh, COVID-19, as with the influenza virus and other respiratory viruses, particularly affects the elderly. The COVID-19 plan agreed to by all governments is an outline of the measures being undertaken and now planned should the risk increase. 
Under the COVID-19 plan, Australian governments work to, provide, to promote the safety and security of people in aged care settings through inf infection control guidelines and safety and quality standards. State and territory governments will establish public health systems that promote the safe, safety and security of people in aged care settings and support outbreak investigation and management in residential aged care facilities. To support the aged care sector, we will be shortly hosting briefings and forums to inform the aged care sector about COVID-19 and assist its preparedness and the possibility of cases. The COVID-19 plan will consider what is needed to protect the most vulnerable members of our communities and address the needs of special groups such as the aged care sector. Under the COVID-19 plan, the Australian government works to promote the safety and security of people in aged care settings through infe infection control guidelines and safety and quality standards. Uh, we continue to work in consultation Mr. President, with state and territory governments and the community. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate of what measures aged care facilities should be taking to ensure they are prepared? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Under the aged care quality, safety, uh, quality standards, the standards, the uh, aged care homes are expected to take steps to prevent, detect, and control the spread of infections. Indeed, facilities should already be prepared for other viruses, such as seasonal peaks of uh, influenza virus. Infect infection control is paramount. Homes are required to have in place an, in an effective infection prevention and control program that is in line with the national guidelines. Aged care homes should also have established protocols in place to manage any health emergencies that arise, in including service-wide infection outbreaks or broader community epidemics such as COVID-19. An aged care home provider emergency plan would consider uh, first steps if infection is suspected, arrangements to ensure that adequate care of the, uh, care of the infected, uh, infected individual, protection measures for other residents, visitors and staff, and notification Order. of families, Senator carers Colbeck. and relevant authorities. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Minister, what can family and friends of senior Australians be doing to prepare at this time? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Again, thank you to Senator McLaughlin for the question. Inf information for families and friends is contained in the fact sheets that I have just tabled. The fact sheets inform residents in aged care homes, their families and visitors how good hand, sneeze and cough hygiene is the best defence against most viruses, washing hands frequently with soap and water before and after eating and toileting, covering coughs and sneezes, disposing of tissues and using alcohol-based hand sanitisers and avoiding contact with others when unwell. Mr. President, it also provides guidance about the travel restrictions initially put in place by the government on 1 February 2020, including the circumstances in which a resident may need to self-isolate in an aged care home and what it means to be isolated. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Sport Australia has given evidence in the, to the Senate that it received the backdated brief from the government approving the community sports infrastructure program, program projects for funding at 8.46 a.m. on the day the election was called. Given the House was dissolved at 8.30 a.m. that day, can the minister explain why the Prime Minister breached caretaker conventions by spending $40 million of the, on the Community Grants Infrastructure Program the day he called the election. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, let me firstly completely reject that final assertion. Senator the Prime Minister did Senator nothing Watt. of the sort. The Prime Minister did nothing of the sort. Uh, as Sports Australia said uh, quite uh, explicitly uh, to the uh, Senate uh, Select Committee uh, inquiring into the highly successful and popular sports grants uh, program, uh, is uh, that the uh, brief approving the third round of uh, applications, uh, the third round of projects uh, was uh, dated the 4th of April 2019. The caretaker period associated with the 2019 election did not of course start until Thursday 11 April and in accordance with the conventions. Decisions taken before a caretaker period can be announced during a caretaker period. Order. Order. Senator Chisholm is on his feet. Order. Senator Chisholm. 
Why did the government provide a brief to Sport Australia at 8.46am on the day the Prime Minister called the election approving the community sports infrastructure program projects when the House had already been dissolved at 8.30am and caretaker conventions were in place? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The decisions uh, were formalised on 4 April. Uh, that is when the brief was signed. Order. And that Senator Wong, on a point of order. Uh, direct relevance. The evidence is 8:46 a.m. after the House had been dissolved. Senator um, Wong, with respect, I think that goes to the substance of the answer. Um, Senator Cormann was being directly relevant. Senator Cormann. Uh, let me remind Senator Wong and the Senate again of the very explicit and clear and unequivocal evidence of Sports Australia at the Senate Select Committee uh, inquiring into this program, and that is that the brief approving those projects uh, was dated was dated the 4th of April. Order, 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 order. Order. Senator Wong, Senator Chisholm is on his feet. Senator Chisholm. Evidence to the Select Committee has now revealed that Prime Minister's and Senator McKenzie's offices exchanged at least 136 emails, over 28 versions of colour-coded spreadsheets outlining political and electorate breakdowns were exchanged, and Minister McKenzie backdated her decision on round three in breach of caretaker conventions. When will the Prime Minister admit his role in driving the sports fraud scandal? Um, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Constantly repeating false assertions doesn't make them true. Doesn't make them true. I, just about everything in that order. question is false. Just about everything order. in that question is false. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Order. We will give the government leave to Senator, explain which of those Senator assertions Wong, are false. Point. Senator Wong, that is not a point of order. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, as uh, Sports Australia made very clear at the uh, Senate Select Committee uh, hearing, the relevant hearing. The um, brief was uh, dated the 4th of April, a week before, a week before, of course, the caretaker conventions kicked in. There's nothing unusual about communications to organise event logistics and announcement arrangements. Senator Seawood. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my questions to Senator Rustin, the Minister for Families and Social Services. Uh, through you, Mr. President, on the, on the 18th of February 2020, the Guardian reported that the government is arguing in documents filed. Order, in sorry, the order, Senator Seawit, please cease. Um, I, I can't hear you, Senator Billick, on a point of order. Mr. President, I really cannot hear uh, Senator Seawit. I, I, I was making the same observation myself. Um, after the after the words Guardian reported, please continue. That's when I lost track, Senator Seawit. The Guardian reported that the government is arguing in documents filed in the federal court that it has no duty of care for income report support recipients harmed by the illegal robo-debt program. Does the government have no duty of care to all Australians, or is it just people on income support? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank Senator Seward for her question. Uh, I will disregard the second part of her question, uh, but in answering directly the first part of her question, uh, the question goes directly to the technical legal matters that are currently before the federal court, and it would be inappropriate for me to comment on them. Senator Seward, a supplementary question. I'd challenge that it's inappropriate for the minister to report here. Does the minister have a duty of care through her role to age pensioners, to people looking for work, for students, for single parents? Has the government a duty of care to these Australians who are receiving income support through this government? It's a simple question. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, can I say that, as the Minister for Families and Social Services, I take my responsibility um, to deliver government policy to assist all Australians, but particularly Australians, uh, that come under my jurisdiction as the Minister for those particular areas? Um, Australia has a, a, a system that supports, in a comprehensive and very targeted way, a social welfare system uh, that looks after all Australians who require some help. Um, as a primary service delivery arm, obviously Services Australia is absolutely committed to providing a, a level of supportive customer service that is appropriate when dealing with people who require the taxpayers' help when they find themselves on tough times. And I think it's absolutely reasonable to expect that uh, the Australian community expects 
uh, a level of responsible stewardship of their taxpayers' money uh, when we help people out. Um, Order, but... Senator Rustin. Senator Seward, a final supplementary question. My question is simple. Does the government, do you have a duty of care to Australians and those receiving income support? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I can absolutely confirm that I have a responsibility to support Australians who require assistance through the social welfare system. $180 billion of taxpayers' money is provided to Australians in need every year, and I have a responsibility to make sure that that is targeted to the people who need it in an appropriate way, that they are supported at a time when they may need a little more support than the average Australian. But we also need to realise um, that. Uh, we have order. A Senator uh, Seward, <coughs> on a point of order. I draw the minister's attention to my question. I was very clear. Does the minister and the government have a duty of care to income support recipients and all Australians? I didn't ask about responsibility. I asked about duty of care. Uh, now, with the minister's answer to the first question, I may have misinterpreted your second and third questions in the sense that I was interpreting them as the common meaning of the words rather than legal term. If, um, so in that basis, I was allowing the minister to answer the question uh, on that basis. I'm happy if you would like to correct me on that, but I, that's the basis on which I've been allowing the minister to answer the question. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and absolutely, um, I have a responsibility to make sure that Australians who need my support and the support of the government and the support uh, that is afforded to them through social security payments. Yeah, sorry, Senator Pratt. She was asking about the legal duty of care, and the minister is obliged to not use um, is obliged to answer because legal professional privilege is not a grounds so, for not um, answering well, the question. A couple of points. I'm sorry. I, I, if that's what Senator Seward, that was my offer to Senator Seward before. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't see you nod on that basis. Well, on that basis, I do have to advise senators, as the clerk has just reminded me, that one can't ask a minister for a legal opinion. But on the basis um, you would like the question interpreted that way. I will re remind the minister of the specific nature of your question and what that term entails. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, Mr. President. And, uh, and on, on the basis of that uh, reinterpretation of the question, I would refer back to my previous answer to the first question, and that is, if you are referring to the legal matter that is currently before the court, the federal court, I cannot comment on that. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian Senator Colbeck. Yesterday, the Minister denied in the Senate that the government was seeking to privatise ACAT services. On January 15, Minister Colbeck told the Sydney Morning Herald that the ACAT tender process would be open to existing assessment organisations, including government agencies, and, I quote, to the private sector. Oh. So How does the minister reconcile these two statements? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I indicated to the chamber yesterday, the, the government currently doesn't procure directly any uh, assessment service in the aged care sector. It subcontracts to state governments uh, for ACAT services and it co uh, contracts uh, to other providers, uh, I think uh, about 17 other providers, for the provision of regional assessment services. What the government has said it intends to do is to create a single assessment workforce. That's our, that is exactly what we intend to do. Uh, and, Mr. President, uh, I have never uh, conceded uh, that uh, the government's intention is to privatise, as the opposition continue to claim. Because that has never been ha, has never been our intention. Well, Mr. President, Senator Wong obviously didn't Order. hear what I just said. The, the private sector actually already provides some of those services right now. So, Mr. President, we don't we don't procure any services directly ourselves. I have also said, Mr. President, I have also said as a as a part of this process that we need to bring the workforce together as one. So that Order. that is that is an objective of the government. Uh, and it was also a recommendation to bring together a single workforce um, as a recommendation of the Tune Review. That is the government's determination. That is what we intend to do. 
so, Mr. President, uh, we need to, to reform the way that ACAT services and RAS services are delivered because there are currently duplications in the system. There are waiting lists in the system, in fact, Mr. President. Um, there are too many waiting too long for a, a state based aged care assessment. And in fact, at the 31st of December last year, Mr. President, 591 people had waited for over 70 not five days for a state-based ACAT assessment. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Yesterday, following question time, Senator Hansen said, and I quote, I have been given an ironclad guarantee by Minister Colbeck that the Morrison government has no desire to privatise ACAT. Does this mean the ACAT tender will no longer be open to the private sector, as the minister has previously said? It would be. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Hanson was right when she, si when she said yesterday uh, that the government had no intention of privatising uh, the aged care assessment process. Uh, I've been saying that for a long time. Despite the, the opposition can pass as many motions, make as many claims as they like. It's not going to change the fact that the government has no intention, never has had any intention of privatising the ACAT process. I said yesterday, and I'll repeat today, we will work closely with state governments to ensure that order. the Senator Australia Keneally, on a point of order. Point of order. My point of order is direct relevance, and I have generously allowed the minister nearly half his time to answer the question. The question was very specific. It was not for the minister to elaborate on Senator Hansen's words, but rather to clarify if that means the tender will no longer be open to private sector organisations, as he previously said it would be. You've reminded, you've reminded the minister of the question. I am listening carefully. Um, in my view, he was talking about the tender process, but I can't instruct him how to answer the question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. We will continue to work very closely with state and territory governments to ensure that senior Australians get the assessment service that they need as they enter into the aged care sector. As, as, as I said before, on average for Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland this year there is over a 60 per cent increase on the previous six months in waiting times. Of those, 344 uh, were Senator waiting Colbeck, in New South Wales. Order, Time for the answers expired. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Will the minister now provide an ironclad guarantee to the Senate that the ACAT tender will not be open to the private sector as he previously said it would be? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, thank you, for Senator Keneally, for the question. As I have said a number of times today and I said yesterday, we will work extremely closely and cooperatively with the states to ensure that the that senior Australians get the, aid, the assessment services that they require for their entry into the aged care sector, sector uh, in an appropriate form and in a way Senator that is— Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Uh, point of order is direct relevance. There's a lot of word games being played, Mr President. The minister has been asked a very specific question in relation to whether or not the tender will be open to the private sector. That is the only question in the final supplementary he has been asked. Um, and Senator Wong, I, I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question. It was quite specific. In my view, as long as he is talking about the tender process referred to in the question, um, that is being directly relevant. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I, will re I will repeat for the benefit of those opposite, just because they say it doesn't make it so. Just because they say it doesn't make it so. We have never conceded, we have never agreed, we have never said that we wanted to privatise the assessment of aged care services Order. in Senator Australia. Senator Colbeck, on a point of, uh, please resume your seat. Senator Keneally, on a point of order. The point of order, again, is direct relevance. The minister is not answering the question he was asked. The question is very specific. Will the minister give an ironclad guarantee that the, o the ACAT tenders will not okay. be open to the Senator, private okay. sector? Senator Keneally, um, on the point of— on the, uh, that, so with all due respect, all right, well, 
Senator Cormann, I'll take you on the point of order before I rule. Point of order. Uh, Senator Corbett was clearly being directly relevant. He was uh, clearly uh, again making the absolute same reassurance that he's made to Senator Hansen, which is of course entirely accurate, and that is because Labor's accusations of privatisations are order, false. Senator Cor now, on the point of order. On the, on the point of order. On the point of order. I'm not going to rule on whether someone is answering a question or not in the sense that is in the eye of the beholder too often and there is a chance to debate it after question time. The minister was being directly relevant by addressing the question. If it's not in a way that the, uh, the person asking the question prefers, there's an opportunity after question time to debate that. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr President. Again, for the benefit of those opposite. We will work cooperatively with the states and territories to ensure that senior Australians get the assessment services that they need in a timely way for, for, to support their entry into Order, the aged Senator care system. Colbeck. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Order, Senator Thank you, Roberts. Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. No remediation is being carried out on the PFAS contamination plumes now spreading outside of defence bases in Oakey and Queensland. Williamtown and Catherine. Prime Minister Turnbull formed the Interdepartmental Committee on PFAS in 2018 under the Department of the Environment to coordinate the government's response to PFAS. My question is to the Minister for the Environment is this. Why is the Department of the Environment not remediating PFAS contamination zones around these defence bases? Now, Senator Roberts, in Senator Birmingham's absence, uh, Senator Cormann is representing the Minister for the Environment. Thank you, thank you very Senator much, uh, uh, Mr uh, President. I thank Senator Roberts uh, for that question. Let me, let me just say that, as a government, we have taken the issue of uh, PFAS uh, contamination very seriously, uh, and we are taking all of the appropriate uh, actions. Uh, obviously, there is a long uh, history to this, and I'm quite uh, happy to I'm quite happy to uh, facilitate a briefing for Senator Roberts. This is a, a complex issue requiring an effective evidence-based, nationally consistent response. Government representatives are in regular contact with community members in areas where PFAS contamination has been detected and the government is supporting PFAS affected communities uh, by conducting uh, extensive site investigations and delivering evidence-based remediation solutions, providing clean water where necessary as well as information and otherwise to reduce exposure, providing dedicated mental health and counselling services where needed and investing in uh, targeted research to better understand the effects of PFAS contamination, including an epidemiological study and a PFAS health research grants program. Uh, the government, as you would be aware, has provided uh, $55 million for a drinking water program for communities surrounding Army Aviation Centre Oki and Rough Bases Piers, Tyndall and Williamtown. Over $60 million in support packages for the Williamtown, Oki and uh, Catherine communities, including an epidemiological study and associated blood testing program, uh, and indeed $12.5 million for a national research program into human health effects of uh, prolonged exposure to PFAS, informed by an expert panel established for this purpose. Uh, there is uh, much more that we're doing, uh, but of course, uh, you know, we are working our way through this in an uh, orderly and methodical fashion. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Before asking the supplementary question, I just want to say that the people who I've listened to at Oki have been devastated and they are not being remediated. Uh, I will, however, take you up on your offer for a briefing. My second question is, let me be more specific. The PFAS contamination plume spreading from RAAF base Williamtown has reached to within 50 metres of the high tide mark of the Hunter River at Fern Bay. It is already adjoining Fullerton Cove. What is your department doing to stop PFAS contaminating the Hunter River? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, the Department of the Environment is working through these uh, issues uh, as appropriate, uh, but I will see whether I can provide further information for Senator Roberts on notice. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The contamination zone at Williamtown is in the Hunter Valley wetland, which is a Ramsar-listed wetland. Your department has direct accountability for the environmental quality of Ramsar-listed wetlands. What are you doing to remediate the damage in the Hunter Valley wetland? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. As I have indicated in uh, my uh, response to the primary question, uh, the uh, government 
uh, is uh, conducting extensive site investigations and delivering evidence-based remediation solutions. In terms of the specific issue that uh, Senator Roberts raises, uh, I will uh, add uh, information to that as appropriate on notice. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is delivering on our plan to invest $100 billion into infrastructure, which is creating jobs and driving the economy, including through the delivery of vital projects in regional Australia, particularly in our home state of Western Australia? Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Brockman for the question. And I acknowledge his commitment to rural and regional Australia, and in particular in our great state of Western Australia. Uh, Mr. President, uh, one of the hallmarks of the Morrison government is obviously our commitment to uh, building the infrastructure to make our transport uh, network safer, to be more efficient, and to be more reliable. And Senator Brockman, between the 1st of July 2013 and the 30th of June. 2019, the coalition government has invested more than $5.5 billion on infrastructure in Western Australia. And in fact, on the 20th of November 2019, the government announced a $868 million uh, infrastructure investment boom in uh, Western Australia, including $817 million in bring forwards. Uh, Mr. President, this accelerated investment will deliver on a range of projects, uh, such as the early construction of the Bunbury Outer Ring Road, obviously uh, very important for us, the Albany Ring Road and the Tonkin Highway Gap, and of course upgrades to the Caratha to Tom Price Corridor. Uh, these investments, of course, will stimulate the economy, and in stimulate the economy, uh, they will support job creation in this government. Uh, is all about putting in place the policies to ensure that we are creating jobs uh, for Australians. Um, we're also, though, investing in the Wheatbelt Secondary Freight Network program. This program of works has actually targeted 53 <laughs> freight routes in need of upgrade that cover 4,400 kilometres of road. This is also an important safety investment as well as an important economic development. Um, in terms of the wheat belt itself, and one of the reasons that this is so important uh, is 600 jobs will be supported during the project. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Minister. Is the minister aware whether the recently updated Infrastructure Australia priority list supports the Morrison government's infrastructure pipeline? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And the government welcomed this week's release of Infrastructure Australia's 2020 update to its infrastructure priority list, which reaffirms the Morrison government's delivery of the infrastructure that Australia needs and deserves. In terms of the infrastructure priority list, it delivers the largest list of projects to date, including 147 nationally significant projects across a range of sectors, including transport, energy, water, communications, housing and education, and it's about $58 billion worth of projects. The list itself focuses on delivering regional and urban projects to support a growing population, to meet the national freight challenges and get Australians, of course, home to their loved ones sooner yeah, yeah. and safer. I'm also pleased to inform the Senate uh, that the Morrison government is already supporting and investing in a number of projects identified on the updated list. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, why is investing in building infrastructure critical to supporting a strong economy? Senator Cash. Mr President, it is all about ensuring that we're investing in those policies that are going to grow the economy and allow job creation. And certainly our $100 billion investment in key infrastructure projects is part of this government's blueprint to delivering jobs, productivity and economic growth to all Australians. In terms of the investment itself, though, it will increase freight efficiency improved road safety, but it will also ensure that local businesses are able to get their goods to market more quickly and more reliably. Whether it's in the north of Queensland or Western Australia, regional areas or urban Australia, Mr President, in terms of our infrastructure investment, all Australians will ultimately benefit. 
The record infrastructure investment, and it is a record infrastructure investment, $100 billion, is all about supporting and building the infrastructure projects that are going to ensure that our economy does grow and we continue to create more jobs for Australians. Senator yeah. Wish Wilson. Uh, President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Environment, and Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Cormann. Minister, Australians love their oceans, especially their barrier reef. Uh, yesterday, key US science uh, organisation NOAA uh, put out their prediction for the Great Barrier Reef. There's a 90 per cent chance of coral bleaching by mid-March. Uh, this would be the third uh, coral bleaching event in just five years. Minister, I presume the government is watching this closely. Uh, are you concerned? Can you update the chamber on what your observations are and what the prognosis would be for the reef if a third mass coral bleaching was to occur? Minister representing the Ministers for Environment and Emissions and Energy Reduction, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much. Uh, well, firstly, what I can say, um, and I'm sure that everybody uh, around the Chamber agrees, the Australian Government is deeply committed uh, to protecting uh, the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef. Uh, the reef generates uh, disappointed that the Greens would not uh, agree with that. That's, who, who would have thought? Who would have thought? Uh, the reef generates 64,000 jobs and continues and contributes 6.4 billion. Wish Wilson on a point of order. On a point of order, President, I asked if the government was concerned and whether he could update the chamber on whether they agreed with NOAA's uh, prediction of a 90% probability of coral uh, Senator, bleaching. There was, there was nothing else that Senator Wish Wilson. But Towards the end of your question, you, you asked a very broad questions of the minister, such as whether he agreed. And I think, with all due respect, with 23 seconds in, he is being relevant to what was a, very, a question with a lengthy preamble and a number of questions at the end. But I am listening carefully. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, let, let me uh, reassure the chamber again. Uh, the Australian Government is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef. Uh, and of course, um, you know, we understand and fully accept uh, that climate change is a global issue and the most serious long-term threat to the health of coral reefs worldwide, including uh, the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, the centrepiece of Australia's reef protection efforts is the Reef 2050 uh, Long-Term Sustainability Plan jointly developed with the Queensland Government. Uh, we work with traditional owners, industry, scientists, farmers and the wider community to implement that plan. And uh, the Australian and Queensland Governments are investing $2.7 billion from 2014-15 to 2023-24 to implement uh, that plan. It's a plan which addresses the key threats uh, to the reef by improving water quality and coastal uh, habitats, uh, tackling, um, tackling outbreaks of uh, crown, uh, crown of thorns uh, starfish, addressing plastics and protecting threatened and migratory species. Senator Wish Wilson, on a point of order. President, I, I also asked what the government's prognosis would be for the future of the reef if we had a third bleaching in the five um, years. Uh, the minister Senator Wish Wilson, that I can't issue. direct the minister to answer part of a question. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, let me reassure uh, Senator uh, Wish Wilson again. The Australian Government is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage uh, listed Great Barrier Reef, and we are taking action together with the Queensland Government and others to ensure that the Great Barrier Reef is in the best, strongest, healthiest uh, position possible. Uh, and, and that is what we will continue to do, and we look forward to your uh, support for that very important work. And you'd, of course, also be aware uh, that the Australian government uh, has invested historic levels of funding, including a $443.3 million dollar Senator brief. Cormann, time for the answers expired. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. Th thanks, uh, President. Given the minister mentioned that this is a, a World Heritage listed reef and the biggest threat to the Barrier Reef is climate change, and I thank him for that acknowledgement. Does he agree that when UNESCO meets in China in June that they should consider the impacts of climate change on the values of the reef and whether the reef is in danger? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, I will let UNESCO make its own decisions. So we will make uh, yeah, the decisions yeah. as an Australian government, and, yes. and the decisions of the Australian Order. government are focused on on protecting the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef uh, to the absolute best of our ability. And, and what I was about to say, the Chamber, before my uh, time ran out, uh, the historic levels of funding that we are providing as a government, of course, include a $443.3 million reef trust partnership with the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. And the Foundation's 2019-20 uh, annual work plan allocates over $58 million for reef action, including controlling crown of thorns, starfish and working with farmers to improve uh, reef water 
quality. Uh, so um, again, let me reassure Senator Rich Wilson, uh, we absolutely uh, are committed to doing everything we can to ensure that the Great Barrier Reef is in the best possible position over the very long term. Senator Rich Wilson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. Minister, marine heat waves are devastating not just the Great Barrier Reef, but also the giant kelp forests off the east coast of Tasmania, seagrass beds in Shark Bay, Western Australia. We've also seen mass fish kills all around Australian coastlines and around the world. Minister, given the impact that such a loss of habitat has on marine life and our fisheries and our fishing communities, uh, how is this not a crisis and are our oceans buggered? I uh, ask senators to just maintain, try and maintain the dignity of the chamber with the use of language. Senator Cormann. Th th thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, this government, not only would we not use language like that, uh, in, the, in this chamber. We are much more optimistic about our future. We think uh, the future of, you know, for our oceans uh, is going to be so much brighter because of the uh, actions that we're pursuing as a government uh, to support uh, effective policies uh, to improve the health of the oceans moving forward. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, no, no. Senator Colbeck. Oh, no. The Australian newspaper has this morning revealed that the days after the Nationals leadership spill, Deputy Prime Minister McCormack lobbied the Prime Minister for a $120,000 grant to keep open an aged care home in the electorate of Nationals ally Damien Drum. Oh. The article also reports that, and I quote, national sources have questioned the due process conducted ahead of the grant being finalised in four days. What representations did the Prime Minister or his office make to the Minister and when did they occur? Why was the grant finalised so quickly? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. President, um, thank, thanks, Senator, for the question. Um, the, the member for Nichols arranged for the Deputy Prime Minister to visit the Murchison community on 31st of October to discuss uh, for discussions on the DP Jones aged care facility, and, and those uh, discussions have continued since then. The circumstances surrounding D DP Jones nursing home in Murchison are quite unique, uh, and as a result, require a tailored solution, which is why the department, um, uh, which is why we negotiated a tailored solution to result uh, for, for a longer period of administration. Mr. Mr. President. The circumstances in the community of Murchison uh, were quite unfortunate where the DP Jones facility uh, had uh, a number of connections to other community organisations. There was a strong desire uh, and interest from members of the aged care community to consider a takeover of the Senator facility. Senator Kitching on a point of order. Mr President, my so on relevance, my question was around the representations uh, did the Prime Minister or his office make to the Minister? Why was the grant finalised so quickly? This is not relevant. Um, I'm listening carefully to the Minister. I was speaking to the managers then about the order of questions, so I missed his late last contribution. Um, I will listen, continue to listen carefully, but it is also in order for the Minister to address the quotations and assertions at the start of the question. That is also in order and being directly relevant. I'll listen to it very carefully. I'll call on the Minister to continue. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the government had provided some assistance to the administrator to uh, extend the period of administration in an attempt to, to find an alternative provider to take over the facilities at DP Jones. Uh, we were coming to the end of that process. We were coming to the end of that process, and there were still some discussions that we wanted to continue with respect to that. So uh, the, de the decision was made to provide additional resources to extend the period of administration so that the negotiations with prospective uh, providers could, uh, uh, could be undertaken. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Minister's department has said of the nature of the grant it had not, and I quote, provided funding of this specific nature before. Why was this new precedent set for Mr Drum? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Well, one of the concerns that the government has is the provision of high-quality aged care across the country and particularly in regional Australia. Here we had 
a community in Victoria that was about to lose its aged care facility. It had a number of other services that were attached to it, Mr. President. It had a doctor's surgery, it had a pharmacy, it had a community house. All of these services were attached to the provision of care at the aged care facility. We were concerned that those things all had the capacity to, be, uh, to continue to be provided in that community. We had a number of providers who were interested in taking over the facility. We extended the, the capacity of the administrator to continue the administration to see if we could find a new provider for the centre. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given $400,000 has already been provided to the aged care facility in Mr. Drum's electorate, can the minister now confirm that the Prime Minister has spent $520,000 of taxpayer money to buy a vote inside the Nationals Party room to prop up his preferred Nationals leader? That's right. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. I want it to collapse. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. As I have just indicated, the concern of the government is for the people in the community of Murchison to ensure that they continue to receive the services that are important to them. As I've indicated, the, the aged care facility was supporting a doctor's surgery. It was supporting a pharmacy. It was supporting a community house. The concern for the government is to ensure that the community of Murchison has the capacity to retain those facilities if we can assist them to do it. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Order, Senator, Senator McMahon. Reynolds. Order. Start. On my left, Senator, please. I'll let you start again, Senator McMahon, because I couldn't hear you. Stan Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister update the Senate on the Coalition Government's investment in defence facilities and infrastructure in Northern Australia, particularly in the Northern Territory? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McMahon for her question and also for her tireless advocacy for defence personnel and uh, for the facilities and support that they get in the uh, territory. Uh, Mr. President, I can confirm that Australia's North has and always will be uh, play an important role in our nation's defence and broader security in our region. That's why this government is investing $8 billion over the next decade in new and upgraded defence facilities in the Northern Territory. These facilities will support new ADF capabilities, such as the F-35A Joint Strike Fighter and also the offshore patrol vessel. Last week, the Prime Minister announced a further $1.1 billion of works at RAF Base Tyndall, taking this government's total investment in the base at $1.6 billion. And this is to ensure that we can continue to deliver a potent air capability from the Northern Territory. Under this $1.6 billion investment, 700 and 30, over $700 million will go towards upgrading the airfield, including extending the runway, building a new air movements terminal, parking apron and extra fuel storage facilities. The works will increase the capability of Tyndall to support the KC-30 multi-role tanker and transport operations. These are a key part of the core air power role of air mobility, in particular air-to-air -air refuelling and air logistics support missions. This will also improve accessibility for Tyndall for the United States Air, air Force uh, aircraft. Another $437 million will also be provided to critical base infrastructure upgrades. This $1.1 billion commitment comes on top of the $495 million already invested in the new air combat capability facility at Tyndall, which will underpin the arrival of the Joint Strike Fighter in the Northern Territory. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how these investments enhance the US alliance and regional security? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. And yes, Senator McMahon, I can confirm that Northern Australia is and will remain our gateway to the Indo-Pacific. This is a region of growing economic prosperity, trade and opportunity for Australia, but it's also one that is more dynamic and more interconnected, and where traditional and new security threats increasingly transcend state boundaries. We cannot deal as a nation with any of these challenges in isolation. And as Defence Minister, I recognise that strengthening the ADF's relationships 
with regional allies and partners is crucial to our nation and our regional yeah. security. This is why we, Australia, remains committed to the United States Force Posture Initiatives. They provide security benefits for both countries, for our regional partners, by deepening the joint operations between the ADF and the US forces, and also it increases engagement with nations right across the Indo-Pacific. The U US still plays an essential role in underwriting the security Order, of Senator the Indo-Pacific. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate on how this program of investment contributes to local employment and investment, particularly in the Northern Territory? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And this is one of the many aspects of our defence uh, industry policies that I'm so proud of. The Morrison government is making it easier for local businesses to get involved in delivering this $8 billion of investment pipeline over the coming decade in the Northern Territory. This government's local industry capability initiative, announced in Darwin in 2017 by the then minister, Minister P Payne, uh, continues to deliver valuable opportunities for local businesses. And since the implementation of this initiative, the average local engagement target for major infrastructure projects has been 79 per cent. We have now met this, and it is now over 80 per cent. The Morrison government remains committed to ensuring the delivery of the best capability for the ADF, investing in infrastructure and supporting a local defence industrial base in the Northern Territory. Senator Billick. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. I referred to the minister's earlier answers. Given former Minister Mackenzie consulted the Prime Minister and his office on the final round of grants under the Community Sports Infrastructure Program on 10 April, how could former Minister Mackenzie possibly have made the decision on 4 April? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I don't accept, I don't accept the characterisation of Senator Mackenzie's interaction with the Prime Minister's office on 10 April, as I've indicated, after the decisions were made in relation to those projects. Of course, of course there was interaction uh, as appropriate to uh, make arrangements in relation to announcements of decisions that had already been made. Senator Billick, a supplementary question. Well, thank you, Mr President. What steps has the Prime Minister taken to satisfy himself that the document signed by Minister Mackenzie was not backdated? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. What I would just say again uh, is that Sports Australia gave very, very clear, explicit, and unequivocal evidence. Uh, this uh, brief uh, was uh, dated the fourth of uh, the fourth of April. Senator Billick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Will the minister guarantee to the Senate that the document signed by Minister Mackenzie was not backdated? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, all I can do again is to point you to the evidence of Sports Australia, which was clear and unequivocal. The uh, brief was dated the 4th of April. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. Oh, Senator Cormann has, has concluded his answer. Senator Wong, I'm afraid there's not appropriate for a point of order. Senator Bragg. <laughs> There. Jeez. Calm down. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's plan is supporting Australian families with the cost of childcare? The Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Bragg for his question and uh, his obvious interest in this very important part of public policy. Um, the Morrison government is absolutely committed to supporting all Australian families, and particularly when they have young families themselves. Uh, in the latest CPI data, confirmed that Australian families continue to pay less out-of-pocket expenses uh, under the Morrison government's new childcare package. The Australian Bureau of Stati Statistics shows that. Uh, on average, out-of-pocket costs have actually reduced by 4.2 per cent, uh, and they're lower uh, than they were before the introduction of the childcare subsidy in July 2018. And this comes off the back of record funding to help Australian families manage the cost of childcare. 
Uh, this year alone, we've committed $8.6 billion towards the cost of childcare, and that will increase to $10 billion over time. At the moment, there are more than 1.3 million Australian children uh, who are benefiting from the subsidy that has been provided by this government through the childcare subsidy. There are a number of mechanisms in our policy that ensure downward pressure continues to be placed uh, on, on remaining uh, to, for children uh, and to, to continues to be put on childcare fees, including the hourly rate and uh, parent co-payments. 87 per cent of centre-based daycare services are charged at or below the hourly cap. And last year, the Morrison government delivered legislation updates that reduced red tape which makes it easier for families to access childcare and makes it easier for them to maintain their subsidy. Uh, in fact, just this week we have introduced legislation to further streamline access for vulnerable and disadvantaged children, and these include those children who are living in foster care to make sure that they get the support that they deserve as well. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the government supporting early education and childcare for Indigenous and regional and rural and remote children. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, in addition to the childcare subsidy, uh, families and services in regional and remote Australia can also benefit from the Community Child Care Fund. This fund is part of the Child Care Safety Net and it provides services with a unique um, um, uh, and I suppose a unique and different operating um, uh, capacity so that we can meet the challenges that are faced in rural and regional areas, particularly around financial and business support. Uh, and this is particularly in the case where there are limited services available uh, in these areas, and sometimes there may be no childcare services. So funding um, totalling $328 million over the next five years has been made available in around 980 services. 70 per cent of that money has been allocated to 480 services that are in rural and regional Australia. And we're also investing $12 million a year in the Connected Beginnings program, which supports Indigenous children aged 0 to 5 and their families in 15 additional communities. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the government supporting the early education and childcare sector affected by the bushfires? Senator Rustin. To make sure that we continue to support um, our bushfire-affected areas as they go through recovery, um, you know, we understand that drought and bushfires and floods um, have a significant impact on the family. So, Through the Community Child Care Fund Special Circumstances Program, we have allocated an additional $5 million for services to those communities that are, have been directly affected by bushfires. Um, services may uh, seek funds, uh, funds for a range of activities. It might be to establish a temporary centre or premises where children can go if their existing one has been damaged or, or destroyed, uh, temporarily op meeting operational costs and addressing the issues of health and, uh, and safety requirements. The Minister for Education also recently delivered a new set of rules uh, that enable charities who wish to support volunteer firefighters with the cost of childcare to do so. So, for families in bushfire areas, uh, they will also be exempt from the activity test uh, for the childcare debt going into the future, so that Order. we can continue Senator to Rustin, support. Senator time for the answer has expired. Senator Stirl. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Damien Mills died tragically at age 35 when he fell overboard while travelling on a chartered vessel off the coast of Western Australia on October 31, 2014. A coronial inquest found Mr Mills' death underscored the need for simple safety processes on charter vessels, such as performing accurate head counts and supervising passengers properly while on board. What action, Minister, has the Australian Maritime Safety Authority taken to improve passenger safety following Mr Mills' death? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Stirl for the question. Uh, Senator Stirl, I have not been provided with a brief on that. I will take it on notice and I will revert to you as quickly as possible. Senator Stirl, a supplementary question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr, Deputy. Uh, Mr. President. I'm sorry. Um, well, Minister, a Senate inquiry into the Australian Maritime Safety Authority has raised serious concerns about the authority's management of Mr Mills' case, 
and the authorities' continued refusal to strengthen safety regulations for domestic commercial vessels. Why has the government minister ignored pleas for sensible action on passenger safety from the committee for the past two years? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and Senator Stirl, I will have to uh, reject the premise of your question. Uh, in terms of the government's record in, of maritime achievements, we actually have a very, very strong record uh, of maritime achievements since 2013. Uh, our economy relies itself, as you know, on safe and efficient maritime trade. Almost 80 per cent of the value of our international trade is moved by sea. Um, and as such, fishing, maritime tourism and transport are important domestic industries. On 1 July 2018, the government took full responsibility for safety services and standards for domestic commercial vessels, which are now delivered consistently around Australia uh, by AMPSA. Industry also remains committed to phasing out two-tier vessels for live sheep exports, with AMPSA implementing changes to Marine Order 43. Uh, but I would reiterate uh, that in terms of safety, we are committed to ensuring— Order, Senator Cash. Senator Stirl, a final supplementary Thank question. Thank you, Mr President. Out of the respect of the memory of Damien, I'll just go straight to my supplementary question. No Australian family minister should have to endure the pain and anguish that the Mills family have experienced. Will the government finally act by supporting my private senator's bill, which ensures that two headcounts are conducted, one at the commencement of the voyage and one at the end, to ensure all passengers are present and accounted for? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, Senator Stirl, the minister is responsible for administering maritime and shipping legislation in support of a safe, efficient and clean Australian shipping industry. This, as you know, includes compliance with international rules on maritime safety and environment, coastal trading, domestic commercial vessel safety and regulation of ships engaged in the order. live Senator animal export Cash. trade. Senator Wong on a point of order. Thank you, Mr President. I'm, I'm disinclined on this matter to take a point of order. But Senator Still, I take a point of order on direct relevance. I take a point of order on direct relevance. This is about uh, headcounts on charter vessels. It's a private senator's bill. Uh, it's not uh, that it is not germane to the question, uh, the issues that the minister is describing. If she wishes to take the question on notice because the government hasn't made a decision, no, no, on the private senator's bill, that would be a respectful thing to do. But could she please respond to the question? Right, Senator Cormann on the point of uh, order. Thank you very much, Mr President. As you've indicated on many occasions in relation to points of orders of this nature, uh, all that is required is for the minister to be directly relevant. So the, uh, the shadow the uh, Leader of the Opposition cannot insist on how she wants the Minister to answer the question. Um, on, the, on the point of order, um, it was a very specific question with respect to a bill and a particular policy measure. Um, you reminded the Minister of the nature of it, Senator Wong. I will listen carefully. She has 36 seconds remaining to answer or to take it on notice as appropriate. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. Uh, and as I stated in relation to the first, the primary question, I don't have a brief on this matter, and I will take uh, any questions on uh, notice uh, and revert Order. to the chamber. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Thank you. Senator McAllister. I've got. Uh, Mr. President. I have a procedural question to raise for you, and I apologise for not raising it earlier. I was not in my correct seat and was not in a position to raise this issue at the time that it occurred. But during consideration of formal motions today, a statement was made by the Assistant Minister for Forestry and Fisheries, Senator Dunningham, reflecting on Senator Keneally's motives in moving General Business Notice of Motion No. 519, which concerned the importance of timely and accurate answers to questions on notice and estimates. And it would be good if you could please review the Hansard of Senator Dunningham's comments and give consideration as to whether they constituted an imputation of improper motives or a personal reflection contrary to Standing Order 1933. Sure. Um, on that point, I do appreciate I got a brief notice during question time. I will go back and reflect the Hansard. Two matters, because I do want to address a question that was raised as well during question time. Um, firstly, 1933 is strict about 
uh, imputations of improper motives and personal reflections on members of this place, other place and various other places. I'll review the Hansard and come back on that. But there was also, during question time, in my view, um, if someone had raised a point of order on this front about a question that alleged the buying of a vote in a member of another place, I would have asked that to be rephrased. The rough hand side I have of this, and I haven't been able to check all of it, but I will come back, is the phrase that has been highlighted to me, but not reread so far, is I would have also asked Senator Dunningham to have rephrased that particular. But I do draw attention to the fact I would have done similar on a question that referred to the buying of a vote. So can all senators please be very mindful of 1933 uh, and reflections and assigning improper motives to other senators and members? Thank you. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Farrell. Well, Madam uh, Deputy uh, President, uh, I uh, rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Cormann, Colbeck to the questions asked by Senators uh, Green, Chisholm, Kitching and, uh, and Billick. Um, as was very clear from the evidence uh, given by Sport Australia today in the uh, uh, hearing that we had uh, before lunch, um, the noose is tightening around the Prime Minister's office. Um, it's becoming very clear, uh, Madam Deputy President, that the Prime Minister's office was up to its neck in uh, both uh, Sports Rorts 1 and Sports Rorts 2. Um, <coughs> what we now know, uh, by a combination of persistence uh, by the, uh, the opposition and information being provided by a range of witnesses, uh, is that 136 emails uh, went into and out of the Prime Minister's office uh, between <coughs> the dates of the 17th of October 2018 and the 11th of uh, April 2019. Um, now, you might recall, because I know you take quite a bit of interest in this, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President, uh, that when this whole issue came up and it appeared that the Prime Minister's office uh, was involved and the Prime Minister himself was involved, uh, the defence that he made. And he dismissed the, the allegations or the claims. He said um, he was just passing on representations. Um, now, let's go back to those figures. 136 emails uh, over that just over six-month uh, six period. Um, <clears throat> during that time, there's actually only 122 working days. So we're in a situation where more than one email between, uh, <coughs> in, into and out of the Prime Minister's office occurred for the whole of that six months. Now, I ask you, uh, Madam Deputy President, is that simply passing on representations? No, no, Ms. Uh, Madam uh, uh, Deputy President. That's an active involvement, an active, consistent, uh, persistent involvement in the working out of where sports rorts one and sports rorts two uh, would end. And all of the, I know, I know Senator um, <coughs> McKenzie has, has taken the fall, and I know <coughs> Senator Canavan uh, followed in pretty quick uh, succession. Um, uh, but the reality is, the reality is, when you look at the factual circumstances here of those uh, 136 emails over 122 days, that the Prime Minister's office was right up to its neck in all of this. And what else do we now know, uh, Deputy President? Of course, we know about the 28 versions, the 28 versions of Sports Rorts One that transpired between. Um, the uh, minister, yes, yes, 28. No, 28. I, I perhaps should repeat that uh, number. 28 versions transpiring over that period of time between the minister's office and the prime minister's office. Again, um, I ask you uh, to consider this, uh, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President. Is that simply passing on representations? Now, what we found out this morning, though, was some other interesting information about the Prime Minister's role in all of this. Uh, and, of course, um, 
uh, the, uh, we, we, we uh, discovered uh, that uh, on, on a particular date, um, the 11th of uh, April uh, last year, uh, that the, um, the uh, <coughs> parliament was prorogued uh, and, of course, um, uh, the provisions of uh, the uh, caretaker conventions come in. Now, uh, when did, uh, uh, did the uh, minister uh, uh, send in this information? Well, the minister sent her approval of tens of millions of dollars of sports rorts grants at 8.46 a.m. on the 11th of April. Now, that's an important time, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, because uh, at um, 8.30 that morning, on the, sorry, 8.29 that morning, uh, the, uh, the Governor General prorogued the Parliament and the Parliament was dissolved. So just over 15 minutes before uh, the, uh, the uh, proroguing, uh, sorry, 15 minutes after the proroguing of Parliament, uh, the Minister signs the document. So caretaker you, convention Farrell, is in place. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, Madam, Madam Deputy President, um, and thanks for again letting uh, uh, us talk about the Community Infrastructure Grant Program. This program that rolled out um, over 600 grants across to small community sports clubs across Australia, and let's not forget that uh, the, the assessment process undertaken by the minister meant that Labor got more grant projects into their electorates than they would have otherwise have got. Um, I mean, let's, let's talk about what the Leader of the Opposition actually said on Facebook on the 18th of March 2019. I am pleased to announce that the restoration of the historic Dawn Fraser Baths has received a further boost with $500,000 grant from Sport Australia. That is from Mr Anthony Albanese, the Leader of the Opposition. That was three weeks, three weeks after the Shadow Attorney-General first wrote to the ANO raising concerns over the Community Sport Infrastructure Program. So Labor loved this program just as much as we did. This program that got money to small community sports clubs, that got our kids in our areas across Australia, Labor electorates, Liberal electorates, National Party electorates across Australia, um, benefited from this grant program. Even on the 20th of July last year, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition wrote on Facebook, pleased to support the Geelong Soccer Club and celebrate a recent $500,000 announcement that will fund an additional two new pitches. Soccer is alive and well in Geelong. Now, this just goes to show this program, there is no one who can actually point to any of the successful recipients of this grant program and say, actually, they shouldn't get that money, they should give that money back. Not one of them. All of, the, all of these projects, doesn't matter whether they went to Labor or Liberal electorates, have been welcomed by the communities in which they were in. And this the program has definitely benefited, and in my interest, it has benefited regional Australia. It has benefited small community sporting clubs, which is exactly what our focus should be. It's about the grassroots. It's getting money out there. It's getting kids involved and playing. Some of the other Labor seats that benefited. The seat of Ballarat, nine projects worth over over $976,000. Bendigo, five projects. Corio, three projects. Franklin, four projects. Fremantle, four projects. Hindmarsh, six projects. Hunter, five projects. Isaac, six projects. All of these projects 
there possibly wouldn't have got funding had the minister relied purely on the Sports Australia ranking. In fact, if the minister relied on the Sports Australia ranking, 231 less projects would have received funding. That's 231 community sports organisations who would not have had funding to complete their projects, get kids active and provide facilities for their regional communities. <clears throat> and let me just take the opportunity to remind those opposite who are focused on uh, the Prime Minister's engagement with the Minister's office. Well, I would hope that my Prime Minister is talking to his ministers. And the Auditor-General found that while there were many representations coming into the Minister's office about the grant funding program, our interest was on the decision-making process for the allocation of funding, and the reason we didn't go into the representations was because, and I quote, I didn't feel that it was material for the decision-making process. The, the Auditor-General himself did not find that the correspondence or representations from the Prime Minister's Thank you, office— Thank you, Senator Davey. Your time has expired. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I am very sad to see that the National Party senators have already left the chamber no doubt to you know, take themselves home on as early a flight as they can get. Uh, uh, just resume your seat. Senator Scar. Uh, point, of, point of order, Deputy President. I understand uh, that it's disorderly to reflect on the absence of a senator uh, it is in indeed. this context. Uh, I gave so, Senator Kitching some leeway because she didn't name senators, but she did name the party, so I'll just remind her it is disorderly to mention those who've left the chamber. Thank well, you, Senator Kitching. Um, I think that there would be some um, members of th those sitting opposite in the in, in a corner who uh, might be very uh, sad about turn, recent turn of events, and um, you know they they've left they've they're um, still trying to come to grips with what's happened uh, in. Oh well, they lost a lot of ministers, Senator Farrell. But you know they're feeling like the neglected country cousins. Uh, they're reduced to squabbling over the deputy speakership. Uh, we now know that in the days following the Nationals' leadership spill, the Deputy Prime Minister Michael McCormack, uh, who we all know is a decent person and does a pretty good race call, Deputy President, um, he well lacks the authority to hold the farm together. Well, he lobbied the Prime Minister to dole out $120,000 on top of the $400,000 already given to keep the doors open for an aged care facility in the electorate of one of his dwindling crew of allies, the member for Nichols, Damien Drum. Now, I can tell you that Nichols is a very important agricultural area in Victoria. Uh, it has the Goulburn Valley in it. It has SPC fruits. Uh, I have visited there. What I did love about um, the various groups I met with uh, in Shepparton was that they all informed Mr Drum, the member for Nichols, that I was arriving, uh, and he said that I was most welcome to come because he had no worries about holding his seat. And now we can see, perhaps, that of course he didn't have many worries because uh, he, was, he had all of these well, really pork barrelling lined up uh, to dole out to his constituents. The pork barrel is so blatant that even some in the nationals uh, who have proven over the years to not be averse to a bit of doling out of swine, have complained that due process was not followed. Does this all answer the question of how much a vote inside the Nationals Party room is worth these days? And it seems $520,000 is about, give or take, is about the mark. I ask those you know, who, who might be here in the chamber at some point, or if they're in their offices, um, that whether they would let themselves stop being trampled upon by their coalition partner, who might seem to only care about taking their votes on the floor, because they don't seem to give much care and heed to their junior coalition partner otherwise. And we needn't look further than the recent ambassadorial appointments. It's clear that the Liberal Party have successfully pushed out national parties, party MPs, former MPs, uh, exclu because excluding Peter McGoran, the last National Party identity to be appointed 
an ambassador with the late Honourable Tim Fisher AC, who was actually appointed not by the Liberals, Madam Deputy President, but by Kevin Rudd's Labor government in 2008. We are better friends, perhaps, to the National Party than the Liberal Party. The $100 million sports Rorts frenzy, which we now know was carefully coordinated from the Prime Minister's office, has already crystallised in the minds of the Australian public the rot that has become the modus operandi of this tired three-term government. I encourage those opposite to stop propping up this Nigel No Friends Prime Minister. I especially encourage those with a sense of morality and history to search their consciousness before covering up for this Prime Minister's rotting and deception. History, of course, tells us that he won't be here for much longer. The Liberal Party might have changed its party room rules, but everyone knows once the member for Dixon or the member for Pearce or the member for Kuyong have the numbers, they will use them. After all, it only takes 50 per cent plus one to change the party room rules. Now, gather round while we have a little bit of a history lesson. We had Mr Morrison in his circle of six supporters. Uh, remember, they all gathered around. Remember, he gave then Prime Minister Turnbull the hug of death. This is my Prime Minister. I'm ambitious for him. Remember that. Uh, anyway, they will be probably, you know, baboons have been on the notice paper today, Madam Deputy President. Um, Mr. Morrison and his circle of six will be stampeded into the dust by the rampaging baboons of the Liberal left and right, because Mr. Morrison doesn't actually have a support base in his own party. In order to succeed his hug of death of the former Prime Minister Turnbull, the Prime Minister had to form a devil's pact with the moderates in his own party, as the Conservative flank had coalesced Thank behind— Thank you, Senator Kitching. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. And thank goodness it has expired. Madam Deputy President, thank goodness it has expired. Can I say to this chamber, in terms of Damien Drum, the member uh, who managed to advocate for an aged care home in his own electorate, which had gone into voluntary administration, had gone into liquidation, and managed to get some urgent funding to keep that facility open with all of its associated ancillary services, that is, as a senator, exactly what I would expect from a member of the lower house advocating for his constituents. An aged care facility closing down and the local member, it's in administration, a lot of vulnerable people in a very difficult situation, and the local member advocates for those vulnerable people. He delivers funding to that establishment. He keeps it open so it can, so it can continue providing aged care services and health services to his constituents. That is exactly why we're here, Madam Deputy President. That is why we're here, to deliver those sorts of services in that crisis situation to our constituents. That's the reason we're here. That's not pork barrelling. That's discharging your obligations to your communities and to your constituents. Moving on to the sports grants program, and I note Senator O'Farrell's here, 136 email— uh, Senator Farrell? I think if the, uh, the member is going to go, or the senator is going to go down that track, he could at least uh, describe him by my correct name, which is uh, Senator Farrell. He's obviously confusing me with the, uh, the new ambassador to uh, India. Uh, thank you, Senator Farrell. He was in Farrell. fact an O'Farrell. Could you uh, please direct him to uh, uh, Senator call Farrell? You're well aware name? that that is not a debating point, but I'm sure that Senator Scar has heard your contribution. Please continue, Senator he, Scar. He certainly has heard Senator Farrell's contribution. He apologises profusely to Senator Farrell. Madam Deputy President, three, 136 emails in 120 to two days. Is this, the, is this the smoking gun they think they've found, those opposite? 136 emails in 122 days. Well, let's, let's see what the actual Auditor General said. Because you can't have it both ways. You can't, on the one hand, rely on what the Auditor General said in some places, but then in other places disregard what he said. Disregard what he said in other places. And this is what he said. This is what the Auditor General said with respect to the representations. We would not agree with that, that there was a clear causal relationship between local members of parliament saying these are the priority projects in my electorate, those that input into the process and the ones being approved. That's what he said. That's what the Auditor General actually said. That's the actual evidence. You can't pick and choose. You can't pick and choose. 
If, it, if the evidence doesn't suit you, it's still evidence. It's still there. It's still probative. And in another case, this is what the Auditor General said. Yes, and it wasn't the case that we could see that those which came directly from the Prime Minister's office, and this is the 136 e emails, the supposed smoking gun Senator Farrell sees, which isn't there, which is a mirage. This is what the Auditor General says. Yes, and it wasn't the case that we could see that those which came directly from the Prime Minister's office were more successful than those which came from a local member direct to the Minister's office, rather than through the Prime Minister's office. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here, Madam Deputy President. What there is to see when you look, and I did it during question time, I actually looked at the grants, the successful grants in my home state of Queensland, and I saw that there were grants which were awarded across the breadth and width of my great home state of Queensland. Mount Isa, held by the Honourable Bob Catter. Mount Isa, an independent seat, independent seat of Kennedy, held by Honourable Bob Catter. It got a grant. Palm Island, one of the most socio-economically disadvantaged areas in my home state of Queensland, was successful in getting a grant. Ipswich, in the federal seat of Blair. Logan, in the federal seat of Rankin. Projects held in the federal seats of Morton, in Oxley. I was, in fact, invited to the opening of one of these uh, successful grant infrastructure projects in the federal seat of Oxley. I declined because I knew I didn't want to take away. I didn't want to take away from the efforts from the Labor member for Oxley, Milton Dick, who'd worked so hard to secure that project in the federal Labor seat of Oxley. The federal Labor seat of Oxley. Because the fact of the matter is, before the minister, before the then minister intervened and did what ministers should do in terms of making final decisions in accordance with the guidelines, before the minister intervened and made those final decisions, only 26 per cent of the grants, only 26 per cent of the grants were going to Labor held seats. After the minister, after the minister had exercised her discretion and considered what was right, what was wrong, where should the money be best directed, 34 per cent went to Labor seats, an improvement of 8 per cent. And I'm sure the constituents in each and every one of those seats are thankful. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Chisholm. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And what we've seen uh, once this Sports Rorts Committee has been meeting is that every day, in a new way, uh, the protection racket that they've been trying to build around the Prime Minister and his office gets dismantled. And that's what's occurring. We've only had a couple of hearings now, and we're getting so much new information about how this goes to the direct involvement of the Prime Minister and his office in this program. And that's why they're getting outraged opposite, because they know that this is creeping up on them and this is that they are going to be held accountable for. First we had, and that's, this is what it started, well actually it started with the report from the audit office. That's what started this. Uh, then we had the resignation of Senator McKenzie after the ANOAO report had come down. But Senator McKenzie didn't resign because of the content of the ANAO report. She resigned because of a, a failure to declare a conflict of interest in the granting of a, a grant to a gun club. So the PM said that all projects funded were eligible. Uh, but what we know is that the ANAO evidence was that 43 per cent of those were not. The PM said that his office did was provide representations. Well, what we know from the evidence is that there are 136 emails, 28 versions of the colour-coded spreadsheet, a breach of caretaker conventions, and twice the Australian Sports Commission raised concerns with the minister's office about the way they were conducting this. And why were they in such a rush to get this program done? And this actually goes to the heart of uh, the determination and the way that they were using this sports grant, because at the end of the day. It all had to do with their re-election. That is what their motivation was in terms of how they used this sports grants program. It was all designed to boost their chances of re-election. And we know this, and this is the damning evidence, is that round one, 41 per cent of the projects were not endorsed by Sports Australia—41 per cent. In round two, it was 70 per cent of the projects were not endorsed by Sports Australia. That's 70 per cent. And then round three. Uh, in the shadows of the election campaign, it was 73 per cent of projects were not endorsed by Sports Australia. So what we know is the political nature of this decision-making by the minister was that the closer it got to the election, 
uh, the more they favoured those decisions which were going to boost their electoral chances. That was actually the whole genesis of this. And that goes to the heart of the Prime Minister's involvement as well, because there's no doubt that this sports grant program was part of their re-election strategy. That's why the Prime Minister's office was so keen to know what was going on. That's why Minister Mackenzie was so keen to ensure the projects that were approved were in those marginal and target seats. Why else would she add the column? Why else would she add the column to the spreadsheet other than to identify those marginal and target seats? But what they did is, when they sent the spreadsheet back to Sports Australia, oh, we'll just delete that column. Oh, that, how clever was that? Oh, we'll just delete that column before we send it back to Sports Australia. But we know that the decisions that the minister was making was based on that target and, target and uh, marginal seat list because they were determined to boost their election chances. Uh, so we know that they were running a re-election strategy. They gave up on running a government. All they were doing was running a re-election strategy, and they were using this sports program to have the heart of that strategy. So that was what they were up to. They were using this program. They were using it to fund targeted and marginal seats. We know it was up to 73 per cent in the last round that went for ministerial approval that Sports Australia did not recommend. But they're treating the Australian people so arrogantly because they can't admit the truth. Because dis disregarding the thorough independent assessment from Sports Australia to fund their own projects is beneficial to them politically. The reason they can't admit that is because it actually goes to the very heart, the very legitimacy of this government. The fact that they are using this program as they were, um, all part of their re-election strategy, goes to actually the very legitimacy of this government. So that's why they need to uh, treat the Australian people with contempt. They treat those mums and dads and volunteers that put so much effort into putting forward submissions um, to get project funding that were rejected by this government, even if they did score uh, a high recommendation from Sports Australia. And they're completely disregarding the will of the Senate over multiple uh, orders for production of documents and other things that would actually assist us getting to the bottom of this. Uh, the, the government are treating that with contempt, providing redacted copies and actually not enabling us to identify who those community groups were, who those people who put in so much effort to be rejected by this government. But we will continue to put the blowtorch on them because the Australian people deserve Thank so you, much Senator better. Thank you, Senator Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Farrell be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.